Welcome to Capital Gains, Yahoo Finance's unique look at how US government policy will affect your bottom line long after the government polls and the presidential polls have closed. So this week, of course, we've been looking at what we've heard from Vice President Kamala Harris regarding her taxes and small businesses, and also heard from Trump on Thursday morning as well. We'll be getting into all of that and really what this is doing for American businesses. And of course, Election Day, just two months away at this point. So we also have our eyes on the stock market and the moves being made there. Can the markets really give us an accurate gauge of what's going to happen here? We'll be breaking all of that down later on with Jeffrey Hirsch of the Stock Traders Almanac. But first, of course, as always, want to introduce my co-stars, Ben Werschkel and Rick Newman. So hello to Ben and Rick. So taking a look first at what you've been watching this week. Ben, let's kick it off with you. Yeah, so um, so busy week this week for sure, especially on economic policy. As you mentioned, we have news from Kamala Harris and from Donald Trump. I'll just run through it quickly and we can sort of talk over what, what interests folks. Um, so for Harris, this is business week. We, a couple weeks ago, we had cost of living week where she talked about prices, home, home prices, grocery prices. This is small business week. She unveiled a $50,000 tax credit. She was talking in a speech yesterday about trying to encourage investing, which isn't something you normally hear from a Democrat. And then, and then Trump today had a big speech in New York at the New York, at the Economic Club of New York. A few headlines there. I mean, I think the buzziest one is going to be Elon Musk. He um, fully endorsed a government efficiency commission that Elon Musk floated a week, couple weeks ago, which Elon Musk says he's going to head. We'll see. We'll see what that actually looks like. This is kind of a waste, fraud, and abuse in the government that they say they say they can save a lot of money from. We'll see. Um, Trump also really doubled down on his tariffs. That's one of the things I'm writing about today, that this is, he's been getting criticized for his tariffs for weeks. It's not stopping him at all, and he's really tripling down. So so those were my big takeaways. Rick, what, what else jumped out of you? I'm salivating at the idea of uh, Elon Musk running a government efficiency commission. Um, it would <laughs> yeah. only be about the 3,090th uh, government efficiency commission that has ever existed. Musk, of course, thinks, you know, he's the first guy who ever had this idea. Um, he should he should Google Simpson Bowles or Bowles Simpson, whatever it was right. under Obama. There have been many, many, many of these. Uh, every think tank in Washington, D.C. has a pl- has its plan for how you can make government more efficient. Guess what? Government is not supposed to be efficient. I mean, this is why the Pentagon has these giant weapon programs and they get outsourced. You know, they're subcontractors in all 50 states because every member of Congress with a district wants part of that action. That's the way government runs. But, you know, I hope I think it Kamala Harris should appoint Elon Musk uh, to a government official. Let him run it for her. And then maybe he'll actually learn how government works. Oh, yeah, that's my rant on Elon Musk. In addition to what you were talking about, Ben, another thing that's been making headlines is Goldman Sachs finds that uh, if Trump gets elected and he enacts his whole plan, lo and behold, the economy would actually shrink in 2025 rather than grow. That has been getting some headlines in the Harris campaign grabbed onto that and sent notices around. But Goldman Sachs is not the only uh, organization saying this. I mean, there are a lot of organizations, especially some of the economy, economic forecasting firms, that have been trying to estimate the impact of the Trump and Harris plans, practically all of them, Oxford Economics, Capital Economics, Moody's Analytics. And they've all basically find the same thing, which is that Trump has two real turds in his economic plan. One is the tariffs Ben just mentioned, uh, basically a tax on most you know things almost everybody buys. And then his mass deportation, which uh, whether you agree or not that th- th- we have too many undocumented immigrants, you would basically just take a big chunk of the labor force and send it out of the country. Uh, so labor would become a little bit more scarce. Wages would probably go up. Labor costs would go up, both inflationary. Um, no economists really like these ideas. But uh, I guess the world finally notices when Goldman Sachs, name brand, Wall Street, white shoe firm comes out and says it. I mean, you have to wonder which informs which, because obviously markets, they're, they're going to be speculative. We also have another, a lot of other factors going on we've seen with, you know, a lot of the tech related volatility that we've seen around NVIDIA. There's, there's so many things, plus some of the seasonality, which we'll get into with our guests later on. But Ben, what should some of these businesses that are seeing all these promises being made, what should they be taking away from this at the moment? I mean, my rule is, you know, there's about 800 steps between any of these ideas and it actually being implemented. <laughs> Tariffs are a little different because Trump can do that on his own. The ones I would encourage our audience to focus on are taxes, because Washington has to do a tax deal next year. The bunch of Trump um, tax cuts expire at the end of 2025. So basically, every side knows that there, there needs to be some sort of deal. So a lot of these tax ideas would 
presumably be on the table and, and as part of the discussion in, in the year. So that's taxes is what I'd watch. Tariffs is another one. Ben's right. And what I would add to that is um, every time you hear one of the candidates saying my, my policy or is my plan is usually what that means is I would do this if my party uh, had unified control of Congress and I could get everything I want through Congress and legislation, which you can't even get done even when your party does control Congress. And one perfect example of that is Joe Biden uh, wanted to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 28 percent. Well, Democrats did control Congress for his first two years, and Biden could not get that done. He barely got any business tax increases through, even though that, though that was a big for, part of his uh, platform that he ran on. And Kamala Harris still says the same thing. She wants to do the same thing, raise a business tax to 28 percent. I think when people hear all these proposals, they, they should think this is a wish list uh, this is a wish list that the candidate is putting out, and most of these things are uh, super unlikely to ever happen. We'll certainly hold that thought, and of course, we'll cover some of that with our guests coming up after the break. So, do stay with us here on Capital Gains. Welcome back to Capital Gains. Let's bring in Jeffrey Hirsch of the Stock Traders Almanac to talk us through how markets are reacting to the election. Thank you for joining us. So, Jeffrey, I first want to walk to through the sort of data that you track and mm -hmm. how investors can really use that data in the run up to an election. Well, number one, government efficiency, kind of a paradox in and of itself. So, um, <laughs> you know, we have a page in the Almanac about how the government manipulates the economy to stay in power. And uh, that's kind of what we're seeing here. Um, the two months leading up to the election, um, September, October, the weakest two months of the election year, you know, you have this uncertainty and with Biden dropping out, it sort of brings a little bit of the open field pattern in a play where the market's generally weaker. You can see it in the in the charts, in, in the performance of September and October, September, the worst month of the year in any year. Uh, but some of this uh, election year bullishness that has impacted um, like August and other months, doesn't really uh, uh, come into play in, in September, October. We see weakness, that sort of uncertainty leading up to the election. We don't know who's going to win. Um, I think the biggest, uh, um, you know, thing, the biggest concern I have is us not having a decision on or uh, shortly after election night. Um, that would be the kind of thing like we had in 2000 and even with what happened last time um, where we had some sort of undecided election situation. But, uh, you know, you guys were talking about Congress. Uh, we're sort of hinting at that. And, you know, people talk about what party, what presidential party is better for the, the, the market. It really is about Congress. And if you are, you know, betting or, or at least uh, trying to find, trying to decide who you'd rather have in office based upon your stock market performance, you want a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. You get the more conservative body holding the purse strings, a little more progressive thinking, uh, coming up with new ideas in the White House, best performing, uh, you know, markets under Democratic presidents and um, Republican Congress is about 16 percent and change uh, for the Dow or S&P. So Jeff, that's kind of where I'm thinking. Go ahead, Rick. Sorry. Jeff, is this is this um, a normal election year in terms of the market, the, the way the market is playing no. it or pricing it in so well so why don't you tell us what's ever so you just said I mean so one of the questions we've had here at yahoo finance all along is at what point does the does the market start focusing on the election as a as sort of a dominant driver and we've had a lot of other things going on i mean inflation obviously and what the fed whether the fed is going to cut couple rates couple of wars so does it yeah that too so at what is the market now beginning to price in you know possible election scenarios or is that yet to come well, it's not necessarily this possible scenarios. It's the fact that we are coming closer to a decision um, in a couple of months. And I think that's what part of that seasonal weakness, that, that four-year cycle weakness in September, October, happens when you get to this this time of year in the election. But there's this overarching you know, macro trend with AI, the technology uh, you know, boom that we're having that's, that's pushed the, the performance this year way above all the averages. But we've seen some bullish election year you know behavior so far and we're seeing this sort of volatility tick up here in september as we get into the election so um it's it's typical trend but magnitude and level wise it's not we've seen much bigger gains than we normally see in election year but still bullish so i mean i was bullish you know coming into the year we were calling the, the bottom in, in the midterm low in, in 22 we got bullish last october um, you know, next year is probably a little bit more bullish than people realize, considering the recent trends with the post-election. But right now, 
the country is 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 dealing with uncertainty of who's going to be in office. You got a little bit of that open field pattern, you know, uh, uh, thrown in now that we've got uh, a, a new candidate running, taking over for Biden. But in general, um, you know, I'm bullish. Uh, I think we got some volatility here. I think the lows are in play, uh, at least the the uh, intraday lows in August, and as well the the April lows, which were we got pretty close to on Nasdaq uh, on that August fifth, you know, Monday intraday sell off. So. Um, not looking for anything bearish, but just a correction. And, uh, you know, this is the time of year where we, we, we wait for that fat pitch. We look for our, you know, best six months buy signal in October. And um, I think we're just sitting, setting up pretty, pretty nicely for a Q4 rally. And, and the, the, the rally in a Q4, especially in election years, is, is really sort of a, a celebration or a relief that, oh, we had, you know, an election and somebody, you know, we had a decision. So now we can move on with the rest of the, our lives. So I, I think Thank you've seen God that over. right here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. One, so, one term, well, yeah, one term you, well, you have, Jeff, that I really, really liked was October phobia. And I was hoping you could kind of un unpack that for our audience a little bit. What does that mean? How should investors think about that? And how much is that about just kind of a temporary chaos of the sort of final stretch of the election? How much of it historically is about policy? Um, it really has less to do about policy and it's more about October seasonality. I mean, you throw in some of the, the election, you know, anticipation undecided aspect in October, it sits there as well. But, you know, it, it's interesting that the, the election is the, the, the first uh, uh, Tuesday after uh, first Monday in November, and you've got October sitting at the beginning of the fourth quarter, and you've got this mutual fund, 40 act fund, October 31st deadline that has all of these you know funds having to reconcile their accounting from the previous year's 10 months and the current year's 10 months and last year's uh you know full calendar year for year end it's an ir um an irs in the irs code and then you've got you know this is this is a market that's driven by institutions institutions operate on a quarterly and an annual basis we got the end of the third quarter in september we got that week after you know uh, options expiration quadruple witching really weak and, you know, we always say, you know, September, it's back to school, back to work and uh, portfolio managers clean house, restructure portfolios, do a lot of win window dressing. And that's what creates this this October phobia, which is the tendency for crashes, massacres, sell offs, things to happen in October. But it's a phrase my father invented, my late father, Yale Hirsch, who created the Almanac back in the 60s. And back in the 69 Almanac, he has October bargain month and bear killer. So while October is volatile and, and we often, you know, have sell offs. It's usually a, a time for market turns, which we had, you know, textbook turns the last couple of years, uh, 22 and 23. And I'm not, you know, saying we're going to have a similar kind of sell off, but I think we're going to have another great buying opportunity in October. And as we say in the Almanac, late October is a great time to buy stocks, especially techs and small caps. And um, I think it's setting up for that with this current vol. So, Jeff, in terms of sectors, then, obviously, you have two candidates and two different sets when it comes to the House uh, in, in Congress as well. In terms of economic priorities, if you're an investor, which of the sectors do you think people should sort of be looking at now versus will it be too late after the elections? Well, right now, you know, sector wise, we're a little defensive seasonally. Uh, I'm in the utilities. I own the XLUs and some of the bonds and we, we've got a lot of cash in the sidelines. But coming into October, most sectors hit their their bullish period and that's seasonally um i think that the the private sector and the macro trend of tech is going to be there we're seeing some nice rotation uh where the equal weight index indices are starting to do well. a lot of stocks and you know a lot more stocks are moving up so i don't think there's a, a specific sector based upon trump versus harris that's going to do any better um, I think it's really getting through the election and getting into, you know, a, a, a new cycle. I mean, generally, um, post-election years uh, used to be much weaker going back to 1896 when the Dow started. But since 85, it's the best year in a four-year cycle, about 17 percent. A um, couple of losses uh, versus the pre-election year, which is, you know, last year, 23, used to be the best one. Still a close second. But. Um, I'm not seeing any different sector for, for either one. They're kind of they've, they've even got some similar policies, you know, with 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 some of the, you know, going to not tax tips. And they're, they're trying to play to both the same people. And I think it's more about getting a decision made, getting into, uh, um, you know, the next year with a, you know, a, a transition of a transfer of government um, being smooth and clean. 
which is, I think, the bigger risk right now. Jeff, you mentioned earlier um, markets do best with a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. So that's divided government. Um, do you think there really is a meaningful correlation between uh, the party that controls the White House and stock market returns? No, I think it's more the party <laughs> that controls Congress. <laughs> okay, so Republican so, Congress is. So explain that. Um, so, so if well, so, so markets do better with a re- Republicans having at least one chamber of Congress and a Democratic president than they do with Republican con- with a with, with unified Republican control of government. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. Right. So Be- better with with Republican control of both houses and a Democrat in the White House, but Republican Congresses both houses versus Democratic Congress both houses is better. So here's here's what I'm getting at. Like, better. if you were going to break this down over, I mean, it's not like it's a huge data set, right? I mean, it's once every four four years we measure the st- the performance of the stock market. Um, I mean, you were great. There's going to be some correlate. I mean, you could that could just be random. Like, do you actually see causation in that? Causation is always hard to um, to, to you know to to pinpoint correlation. We can see. Uh, But I think the fact that Congress controls the purse strings, and that's where the laws are passed, and Republicans are generally fiscally more conservative, or have been, there's been some pretty, you know, uh, spend happy Republicans, but mostly in the White House, I think there is some causation there, that you've got a much, you know, um, more cautious body, skeptical body about spending more money. Uh, when it's run by Republicans, and that's what what the history has been. So, so the, I see some causation there. So the the follow through then is, um, as we get close to election day, I mean, we're, we're you know we're going to have probabilities. Uh, is it going to be you know Kamala Harris might be ahead, but then the question is, is it possible she could get a Democratic sweep? Um, is it is it? I mean, do you expect that the market will begin to gyrate based on those types of scenarios, not just who the winner is going to be? but whether it's going to be divided or united government. And then once we actually know the outcome in November, will the market react accordingly? I think we're seeing that that jitter, that, that jittery behavior right now. Um, if I were to be a betting man, which I can have been known to be at times, I would bet we still have a split Congress by um, after this election is mm-hmm. over. I'm not 100 percent sure which house is going that's a which safe way. Bet. I, think it's I mean, that's a pretty safe bet. We've had it for a while, but, yep. you know, divided government, as you said, when it's Congress one side and, you know, the White House, the other side is is better because we've seen this with with the divided Congress. There's been a lot of uh, difficulty getting things done. There's more bickering than actually, you know, legislating or, or compromise, which, um, you know, it, it, if we had our wishes, that would be what I'd like to see most, a functioning, not dysfunctional Congress working with the White House agreeing on some things that everyone can agree on and moving on instead of fighting about stuff. Well, certainly we expect to see a lot of fighting. We'll be looking forward to the debates coming up on September 10th as well. See how that pads out. Obviously, the last one was a game changer. (laughs) Jeffrey Hirsch, thank you so much for joining us from the Stock Traders Almanac. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me. All right. So, of course, still looking at um, a lot of voter blocks out there who might be making their decisions later on when they hear it from the debaters later on on September 10th. But something I want to look at, a voter block that a lot of people perhaps haven't really thought about, the McDonald's voter, at least when it comes to relatability, <laughs> which can be a little bit cringe for some of the candidates as we've seen so far. And then I know you wrote about that as well. Tell us mm-hmm. how McDonald's got into the mix here. Yeah, well, the the reasons are per, pretty are widespread concerning McDonald's. A couple of stats that are kind of blow me away. One is that according this is according to McDonald's, nine in ten Americans visit a McDonald's at least once a year. So nine in ten Americans, and then one in eight Americans has actually worked at a McDonald's at some point in their life. So <laughs> it's perhaps one of the most common, well known brands in the country, and we've seen a lot of chatter on it on the campaign trail in the last couple of weeks. The the impetus of this is Kamala Harris. She's talked in the last couple of years about a summer stint she had working at McDonald's. She's one of the one in eight. There's a few others. Paul Ryan former Speaker of the House, apparently also worked at McDonald's. Um, she's talked about a, a summer stint there and and sort of what it taught her a little bit. She was away raising money, but she was working with people that were raising families on it. And it's sort of part of her message, part of her way to be relatable. And, and then Trump, who, you know, 
has eaten a lot of McDonald's and he's never worked there, but he's he's been a, he's been a very associated as a McDonald's customer has been pushing back. And so it's just sort of shows it's kind of a fun thing. There's a there's a little less impact on McDonald's itself. The actual action for McDonald's politically is at the state level, but it sort of shows kind of how these campaigns are trying to use these companies to their advantage and sort of use it to connect with voters. And McDonald's is a perfect example for it. Well, Ben, didn't um, Rick, didn't somebody work? try to criticize Kamala Harris because she didn't put her McDonald's job on her resume? Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a kind of right wing kind of question right now that there's a, a resume of hers from a couple years out of law school or uh-huh. in law school that doesn't have McDonald's on it. What people are pointing out is that <laughs> I, you know, people tend to not put McDonald's stints on their resume when they're when they're applying for law school. So okay, so just that, that, I mean, I, I I have a confession to make. I I when I was in high school, I was a dishwasher at Red Lobster. And I, mm-hmm. you know, okay, so Yahoo's now re- 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 reviewing my whole personnel file to see what else I <laughs> left out, uh, you know, fail, failed to disclose. I mean, well, my I dishwasher mean, so, stand isn't on my resume either. So, <laughs> I mean, so the, this is what this is what you find on Twitter these days. Well, I hope you weren't stingy with the Cheddar Bay biscuits, Rick. I, I can't imagine you just doling them out. <laughs> I was a dishwasher. I got the Cheddar Bay biscuits that you know people couldn't finish. <laughs> Half eaten Cheddar Bay biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was delicious. there's delicious. a reason I've blocked that out of my memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll have to see if that comes up. But of course, before we wrap here, want to get your thoughts ahead of this, ahead of the September 10th presidential debates. Ben, what are you going to be watching for this debate? We know there was a lot of back and forth as to whether they would still keep the debate rules and who that would favor. What are you going to be watching? I'll give you an issue that I hope comes up. You know, David Muir, if you're listening, this is an ABC um, debate. I hope energy becomes uh, they they really dig into that because there's a really there's a lot on both sides that that both sides aren't really talking about. Trump talked a little bit about it today at his speech, but it's it's kind of the same message. You know, he talks about how he's going to kind of solve all problems with drilling, even though and he overlooks the fact that we're drilling more oil than any country in history in the US right now. So so that's on his side. And then Kamala Harris has a lot to explain more on, on what her position would be on fracking. So that's my hope as to what comes up. What I think will come up is a little more kind of attacking each other. One's, one's communist Kamala, one is Trump's national sales tax, I, AKA is tariffs. But I hope energy is a, is a big topic. Ben, you're you're such a politics geek. I mean, you you want to tune in. You're you're like one of three people in the country who wants to tune into this for policy reasons. I mean, I think like everybody else, like all the other people in America, I'm going to be watching to see the brawling. I and in particular, d- does either one of these candidates land sort of a knockout blow? And this reminds me that uh, before the uh, first debate with Biden and Trump back in June, I was on one of our shows uh, here at Yahoo Finance, and I think Josh was the anchor. He said, you know, Rick, everyone's excited about this debate. The debates even matter. And look how much that debate mattered. I mean, that debate yeah. basically drove Biden from the race. So um, debates do matter, especially if there is some kind of takedown moment or if somebody stumbles as badly as Biden. So that's what that's what I'm really looking for. Does one or the other score something that looks like a knockout blow? I think um, Harris is going to try to make Trump look old and feeble and um, maybe see if she can get him kind of tongue twisted. So uh, and kind of demonstrate her skills as a as a former prosecutor. Um, so that's the setup to me. But uh, I'm, I'm going into this like it's a WWE match, basically. Well, there you go. Whether you have your policy cards or your popcorn ready, I know everyone will be (laughs) intensely watching to see what happens here. There's going to be lots of watch parties because we're quite sad here in the D.C. area. Lots of watch parties here. But of course, we will get you up to date with everything on Capital Gains as well. That does it for this episode. A big thank you to Jeff, to Rick and to Ben and from myself as well. Thank you for watching. Your co-stars. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. 